Chapter 12 Turtle could feel the tides shifting in the village. Dragons whispering about another side to Darkstalker, about how the history scrolls could have been wrong, about how Nightwings should stick with their own and stop mingling with lazy vegetarians. I should tell Glory, shouldn't I? She has no idea who I am, but she'd want to know what Darkstalker is doing, wouldn't she? He worried for a while, watching Darkstalker tell stories of the old days to a rapt audience of dragons. Finally, he scooted back along his branch and set off in the direction Glory had gone. A short distance beyond the Nightwing village, all the trees began to look the same. Not long after that, Turtle realized he didn't exactly know where he was going. He stopped, hovering in midair, and glanced around at the dense, never-ending greenery. Lost in the rainforest. That sounded exactly like what would happen to the Turtle character in a story. While the heroic heroes battled onward, wondering vaguely where he'd gone. Except, in this case, there were no heroic heroes battling, because they were all too busy making friends with a potential supervillain. Turtle sighed. <sighs> so I can't be lost in the rainforest, he thought. I can't be the inept best friend right now. I have to be someone else. The messenger, perhaps, who warns the heroes of the danger and fades back into the background. What would a successful, determined messenger do about being lost in the rainforest? He found a very fat tree with comfortable wide branches to sit on. All around him, the bright red flowers danced, the leaves twitched, the shadows and sunlight darted and glimmered as wind pushed the treetops around. Hello? He said. Any chance I'm being followed? If he was, no one answered. He tried again. I have an urgent message for Queen Glory. She'll want to hear it, I promise. But I don't know how to find her. More silence. More trees flapping their leaves at him dismissively. So, that didn't work. He wasn't quite lucky enough to have any camouflaged rain wings spying on him right now. His immediate instinct was to use his magic. That would be the easiest solution. That was always the easiest solution. Whenever he felt a little sick or too tired for anatomy class or needed help finding something, he'd reach for a magical solution, as long as it was small enough for no one to notice. But he couldn't do that now, because Darkstalker would notice any spell, no matter how small. His talents went to his pouch. Wait, maybe he already had what he needed. He slipped the pouch open with careful claws, tipping it so his animus touch treasures clicked and tumbled together. Near the bottom, wrapped in leaves to protect it, was the piece of coral. It was shaped like a small, lacy red tree with little bubbles all along its branches. Turtle remembered the night he'd enchanted it, the night he'd realized he was anatomous. Queen Coral's sons were rarely invited to royal functions, as there were simply too many of them. But when Turtle, Octopus, and Cerulean were all one year old, their father managed to get them invited to their first grand ball. Turtle's brothers were excited. Turtle was mostly nervous. Would he say the right things? Would he remember all the rules about when to eat, and more importantly, when not to eat? Gil had sent matching earrings for all the princes to wear, each one a heavy gold ring with a pearl hanging from it. Octopus and Cerulean clipped theirs on easily, but Turtle could not figure his out. He'd never worn an earring before. His claws felt too big and awkward to work the catch open far enough, and the earrings kept slipping out of his grasp and floating slowly down to the seaweed carpeted floor of his room. Octopus and Cerulean laughed at him as he scrabbled in the seaweed, which had swallowed one of the earrings completely. It's not that hard. Octopus teased, his phosphorescent scales flashing. By all the whales, Turtle, do you have tentacles for tongues? They turned to swim out of the room. See you there. Cerulean called mockingly. If you ever make it. Octopus agreed, and they cackled their way down the hall. Grimly, Turtle glared at the remaining earring, pinched between his claws. Harg. Earring. He snarled, shaking it. Get on my ear right now and stay there. The earring moved, shimmying in Turtle's grasp. Startled, he let go, and the earring confidently made a beeline straight for Turtle's ear. A moment later, he felt a nudging pinch, and when he looked in the mirror, there it was, hanging from his ear exactly where it was supposed to be. Did I do that? He felt terrified and elated at the same time. If he did that, there was only one explanation. He had heard the stories about Albatross, the ancient Animus Sea Wing, although that particular story didn't end very well. There were fewer stories about other Animus Sea Wings, like Fathom, who were much more cautious with their powers. Despite the horror stories, a part of Turtle had always wondered what it would be like to be an Animus, with all that power in his claws. He had to test it out, to find out if it was real. One of the walls of their room was made of coral, and he noticed a small piece that was nearly broken off. He swam over and carefully snapped it free, then clasped it between his talons. I enchant this piece of coral to help me find someone I'm looking for. He peeked at the coral, but it looked exactly the same. Hmm. My other earring. 
He flashed at it in aquatic. He caught himself wondering whether Coral could speak aquatic just as the little red tree twitched and twisted in his claws. It tugged him down to the seaweed carpet, where it poked through the flapping overlapping strands until it bumped against his missing earring. That might have been the most glorious moment of Turtle's life. It was certainly all downhill from there, if you asked him. He was an animus. His brothers couldn't laugh at him now. His mother and father would pay attention to him. He'd be the star of the whole palace. That was kind of a frightening thought, actually. Everyone looking at him? Everyone wanting him to perform? Everyone waiting for him to mess up? But the truth was, only one thing stopped him from swimming straight into the ball and announcing his discovery to everyone. Stories. Turtle knew how stories worked. He knew that a dragon with strange powers could be a hero or a villain, and a lot depended on how everyone found out what he or she could do. The best heroes were the ones who took everyone by surprise in their hour of need. Just when all hope was lost, the unexpected hero would swoop in and save the day. And if Turtle revealed his power that way, when it was really needed, then no one would be scared of him. He'd clearly be a hero. Drama, excitement, and the chance to do something wonderful when no one saw it coming. That's what Turtle wanted in his story. So he hid his power, waiting for the perfect moment of revelation. The tribes were all at war. Surely it would come soon. But then it came, when his father needed him, and he didn't recognize it. And then it was gone. In the rainforest, far from home, Turtle sighed and turned the coral over in his claws. The last time he'd used it was the day Gil sent him searching for Snapper. Turtle had had to be very surreptitious since Octopus and Cerulean insisted on following him around and giggling over how incompetent he was. At first, he'd thought he'd been very clever to think of using the coral, but it hadn't worked. Something was wrong with it. It kept trying to lead him out of the Deep Palace, which is why he was uselessly prowling the gardens when Gil found him. He should have enchanted something else, even with Octopus and Cerulean watching. He should have realized that finding Snapper was the great thing he was meant to do. He should have revealed his secret right then and saved the day. In fact, he should have used his magic to find the assassin who was killing off the princesses. It was embarrassing and awful that he'd never even thought of that until years later, when Tsunami showed up and figured out who it was. But after Turtle's failure, he didn't know how to tell anyone he was an animus. He'd lost the plot of his story. He kept imagining his father saying, If you had magic the whole time, why didn't you find Snapper? Why didn't you save your sisters? What kind of dragon has this power and doesn't use it to help his family? I'm more disappointed in you than ever. And the longer he hit it, the worse it got. Why didn't he use his magic to rescue his father from the Sky Wings? Why didn't he use his magic to stop the attack on the Summer Palace? Why was he such a useless, wretched excuse for a dragon? Turtle realized he was gripping the coral so tightly that it was leaving an imprint in his palm. He unclenched his fist and looked at it. He wasn't even sure why he'd kept the thing after it failed him. Maybe because it was the first real enchantment he'd ever cast. It reminded him of that brief moment where he'd been so happy and excited about his future. Most likely it wouldn't work now either, but he couldn't enchant anything new, he didn't have many other options, and it was worth a try. Queen Glory, he whispered. The coral twitched and hummed softly, then tugged him northward. He spread his wings and flew, paying attention to the signals it gave, turning him this way and that and upward through the forest toward the canopy. I could have used this to help Peril to find Scarlet, he realized. Or find my friends in possibility. Instead, he had left it behind at school with his other animus touched objects. It hadn't even occurred to him to try using it. He wouldn't have expected it to work, and he wouldn't have wanted Peril to notice it. But it certainly would have been useful, he thought ruefully. Add that to the list of ways I could have helpfully used my magic, and didn't. Soon enough, there was glory. There, in fact, was the entire Rainwing village, tucked into the treetops. As Turtle flew closer, he saw more and more shapes emerge from the leaves. Hammocks and walkways, pavilions and dwellings, silver-furred sloths and beautiful dragons of all colors everywhere. Queen Glory was on one of the highest pavilions, bathed in sunlight, with her wings spread wide. She was asleep, but Deathbringer sat watchfully beside her, scanning the undergrowth for any threats. Threats seemed hard to imagine here, in this peaceful place, but Turtle thought of Darkstalker and his five new superpowered Nightwings, only a short flight away, and he shivered. The coral tugged him stubbornly toward the platform. Deathbringer saw him coming and sat up with a sharply curious but not unfriendly expression. Halt! He called when Turtle was only a short distance away. What business do you have with the Queen? 
The animus touched coral did not like it at all when Turtle stopped and hovered in midair. It jabbed painfully at his palm, trying to move him forward. A bit late, Turtle remembered the coral's weird habit. He would not stop searching for the thing he wanted to find until he actually touched the object with the coral. He wouldn't fly away on his own, but every time he picked it up, it would squirm and poke him until it reached his goal. This had been confirmed rather gruesomely when it dragged him through the palace the night after his failure, just so it could bump itself against the side of Snapper's corpse, in a way that Turtle thought was entirely too smug for a malfunctioning scrap of coral. Um, Turtle said, clapping his other talon around the one that held the coral. I've been watching Darkstalker since you left the Nightwing Village, and I thought the Queen should know what he's been up to. What's a sea wing doing in the rainforest in the first place? Deathbringer asked doubtfully. Are you here with Darkstalker? Like the princess? No, no, Turtle said. I mean, I'm just watching him. Anemone is my sister. He fumbled, but apparently that was enough of an explanation for Deathbringer. I see, he said. Well, I'm reluctant to wake the queen during her sun time. Is it urgent? Um, said Turtle. Probably not. If Darkstalker wasn't going to enchant any more dragons today, did it make any difference? Deathbringer, Queen Glory said with a sigh, opening her eyes. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the concept of ears and how they work, but most normal dragons would find it very difficult to sleep through your loud interrogations. I was giving you the opportunity to pretend to sleep through them, Deathbringer objected. You're usually much better at it. I nearly gave myself away by laughing when you said hold, though. Glory said, stretching and sitting up. I mean, who says Holt seriously? I thought it sounded dignified and commanding. Indeed. Or like a pretentious Nightwing. Glory observed. I am a pretentious Nightwing. It's part of my appeal. All right. Hush you. Said Glory, patting Deathbringer's talons with her tail. Come here, Sea Wing. What's your name? Turtle, Your Majesty. He said. The coral was kind of going berserk as he landed beside her, and she shot a curious look at his squirming talons. I'm Tsunami's brother. One of them. I'm nobody, really. The messenger. Here to tell someone who can actually save the world. I thought you should know that Darkstalker has given a few Nightwings special powers. Special powers? Deathbringer echoed. Like what? Mind reading. Turtle listed off. Super strength. Fighting skills. The power to catch any prey, instant healing, and that kind of thing. Wow. Said Glory. It's going to be hard to compete with that. I wouldn't leave you. Even for a superpower, Deathbringer said loyally. I think that is your superpower. Glory said to him. Extreme heroic idiocy. She arranged her face to look serious again and turned to Turtle. Well, if that means all the Nightwings decide to go with Darkstalker. I suppose my job around here would get a lot easier. She looked wistfully out at the rest of the village, where many of the rain wings were asleep in their leaf hammocks and sunlit nests. That's true, said Deathbringer. Much less grumbling and complaining to deal with. They were kind of growing on me, though, Glory admitted. They were impressively resilient. Not to mention obsessed with scrolls and learning and stuff, said Deathbringer. All your favorite things. I think the Nightwings and the Rainwings could be good for each other, once they had some mutual respect and trust in place. Glory lifted her wings up and down in a soft sigh. Oh well. Wait. You're not going to do anything? To stop him? We have an agreement. Glory said, surprised. Why would I stop him? Um, maybe he's turning his tribe into a kind of super army. Doesn't that worry either of you? Huh. I guess you could look at it that way. Isn't it your job to look at it that way? Turtle thought, frustrated. Maybe if it was anyone else. But I mean, Darkstalker's such a great dragon. I just trust him. Don't you? I do. Deathbringer said, nodding. I like him. Turtle couldn't speak. His head felt as if it was full of squirming, flashing electric eels. All his suspicions coalesced into one diamond-bright conviction. This was not a normal reaction. Not to Darkstalker, nor to any dragon who came in to steal the tribe you were ruling. None of the dragons who'd spoken to Darkstalker were reacting to him in a normal way. Kibli was right after all. He had been under a spell. That calm, trusting feeling he'd had about Darkstalker. That was the work of magic. 
This was why everyone was behaving so weird and unworried. Darkstalker had crafted some kind of spell, something that affected every dragon who met him. It made dragons like him and trust him, and perhaps worse, what if it made everyone obey him, or willing to sacrifice their lives for him? If Darkstalker wanted to, he could turn all the dragons of Pyria, one by one, into his own personal puppets, and nobody would be able to stop him because nobody would even know anything was wrong.